Hello, YouTube. So, yeah, today I'm making a video because lately my mind has been... Well, the mind that I've been aware of, I should say, because my mind, the mind, there are no separate minds. Yeah, the mind that I've been aware of lately has been rapidly kind of alternating and splitting and flipping between positive and negative, black and white, dualistic conceptions, this and that. Kind of like, BB, yeah, kind of like BPD to it. Yeah, like a split or like a splitting episode or emotional splitting or emotional, yeah, emotional splitting is what that's called. <laughs> yeah, it's BPD, it's a trauma response and shit. And lately my mind has been constantly trying to find ways to like explain away what I'm witnessing, do you know what I mean? In a way that makes it like mechanical, like robotic almost, like ones and zeros, dude. Do you know what I mean? Bleep bloop. <laughs> I'm trying to logic my way out of emotion or logic my way out of a dualistic prison, something like that. <laughs> and yeah, it's got me thinking about this idea of this is, dude. I, for anybody who's watching this video right now, there's this one TV show on Netflix called Midnight Gospel, made by Duncan Trussell. And there's this one episode called The Annihilation of Joy. Come in. What is that? She's here. I just want to let you know that your purse is on the counter in case you're looking for it. It's I know. kind of an unusual place for you to put it. That's why I thought I'd mention it. I put it all the Okay. Do you put it on the counter normally? All the time. Okay. I must not be paying attention. Oh well. Love you, mom. And yeah. No, it is. And yeah. Yeah. That's kind of where my mind's been at, dude. Yeah, well, that's kind of the mind that I've been witnessing lately. That's kind of where it's been at. And yeah. So I kind of, this, this dualistic prison, which I'm talking about, this, this soul prison. Oh yeah, I was talking about that Midnight Gospel episode, The Annihilation of Joy. This is kind of what that episode is talking about. It's this idea of a soul prison. And soul prison, for haywire wayward souls, or whatever you want to say, <laughs> as they say in the show, yeah, is a self-imposed limitation where... The soul, essentially, or the ego, whatever you want to say, jiva, the sense of body, yeah. <laughs> Basically, chews their own tongue off and dualistically cuts their way into dulling each one of their senses into a little box where they are blind, deaf, and dumb and can't speak and are constantly like fighting with self-imposed effort, like will, like constantly, yeah, like discontent and unhappy with their predicament. They're not just chilling in soul prison. And so they're constantly fighting against this confinement. And the issue when they're fighting against this confinement is they have no way to communicate. They have no way to like have any perspective. Do you know what I mean? They think about it. If the intellect or the ego or the sense of I, the knife of the mind is constantly digging deeper into dualistic conception, trying to find reality in dualistic conception or through a lens of dualistic conception of self and other, of pleasure and pain, the hedonic treadmill, you know? Yeah, it's like the knife of the intellect turning inward and beginning to consume itself, like an Ouroboros. And if it's a knife, it's like a knife cutting itself, which is reality defying creating a duality where no duality exists. And yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Basically what that results in is the third eye going blind and all the senses going kaput and all that. Yeah. Because, think about it, yeah, if you're a knife, it, it, which you're not, if your intellect or your ego, your soul, is a knife which cuts through the fabric of time, you know what I mean? The time knife, which allows you to progress in time. It cuts through the fabric of name and form, or space-time. The manifest. <laughs> and 
in order to continue progressing through time, in order to continue, yeah, you know, like Groundhog Day and shit, or Soul Prison, in order to continue progressing through time with the time knife or the intellect or the ego, yeah, you can't be constantly self-consuming or constantly seeking in a, one specific direction. So constantly pursuing this and avoiding that. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. If you're constantly pursuing this and avoiding that, you're basically, it, yeah, burning your own fire out, cutting your own knife. Yeah. And it basically results in, if you do that for too long, you end up in a scenario that's something like dualistic soul prison. And nobody puts you there, do you see? Dualistic soul prison is a result, a karma, cause and effect, of having cut reality to so many bits with your mind, having cut the self up so much, and yeah, that you have no sense of compass or clarity or direction or you-ness or unity or any such thing any sense of control or any sense of yeah it, it it will be like it'll it'll feel as if you are just this little bit caught in this massive universe which is way bigger and more powerful than you and it, yeah yeah it, it'll feel like tiny little you in this meaningless speck in this meaningless galaxy in this vast universe where nobody cares and life and death is meaningless and all this shit dualities all false dualities and it, it, it'll either seem like just little old you subject to this horrible machine or it'll feel like you are above all of it above all of it and no, yeah, I, I don't know how to put that, but, like, if you feel like you've transcended all of it, or you're, or if you've risen above all of it, then you've broken free, that is, escaping, the, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> if you feel stuck in it, if you feel stuck in it, if you feel like you are subject to reality, if you feel like you are subject to reality, you're in soul prison. If you become aware that you are not dependent or subject to any of the impermanent, any of what might, yeah, then that's opening the door and becoming free. <laughs> that's how you free yourself. And yeah, basically, if you're in soul prison, if you're stuck in soul prison, if you feel like this tiny little thing trapped in a cage. Those negative emotions? Yeah. <laughs> that's what you feel like. One. It might not be a mistake. Two. Because think about it. Soul prison, hell, samsara, the hedonic treadmill, the wheel, whatever you want to say. It's Buddhist wisdom that there is no difference at all between samsara and nirvana. How is that the case? How is there no duality between samsara and nirvana when hell is so obviously hell and absolutely hell? How is it so that there is no duality between heaven and hell? How is it so? Because all of the tools and the mechanisms and the, the technology of spirit that is used to construct this idea of a soul prison is the exact same vehicle, vessel, easel, whatever you want to say, that is used to paint the dream of reality, or the perfection of it, or the heaven, or the nirvana, or whatever you want to say. It's the exact same tools. It's literally all dependent. It's a mind state, or a state of consciousness. The more and more that the mind assigns negative or positive to any qualia, any bit, any idea, any feeling, any of it, the more and more that the mind does that, the more and more rigidly the mind will only understand reality through conceptions of things like good and bad there's no nuance or even just gray through three without spectrum 
And you see, becoming free is not going somewhere else. This place which seems like soul prison, the dualistic soul prison. Becoming free, you don't go anywhere else. It's like, once you still the mind enough to... One moment. Yeah? Love you. Love you too, pal. I'll see you in a little bit. See you in a little bit? If you want to see me when I get home, let me know. Okay. Love you. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> they do that, they do that. Yeah. In case you're wondering who's in Soul Prison right now. <laughs> and yeah, the same one that they raised me in, and yeah. <laughs> So basically, that's, yeah, the journey, or the archetype of the hero's journey, do you understand? Where the main character, whatever you want to say, the protagonist, has an objective, a buried treasure or some shit. If it's like a national treasure, yeah, like the Library of Alexandria or some shit, dude. The freaking tunnels under the pyramids or... <laughs> Like in the alchemist or whatever. The buried treasure. The archetype of the hero's journey is the hero or the protagonist or the sense of eye or the ego <laughs> is feels like they are devoid of something or feels like they need something or feels like they, they're seeking something. Do you see? They're seeking something. And so they set out on a journey trying to win their treasure or to you know learn their the hidden knowledge or whatever the case may be to get their get their gittins whatever they're seeking that's the hero's journey and the hero's journey is they go out and try and find that and then they either get what they were seeking and realize that what they were really seeking they had all along or what happens is along the way they don't get what they're seeking it doesn't happen or they don't find the treasure or whatever the heck and then they realize that they didn't need that. That what they were seeking the whole time, they didn't need in order to be, yeah, yeah. Whatever the case may be. Either they get the treasure and it doesn't fulfill them. Do you see? Or they don't get the treasure and they realize that they didn't need the treasure. One of the two. Do you know what I mean? The, it can have many different variations on what actually, yeah. Every story ever told is basically an alteration of the hero's journey, where they left to go find something. And the entire time they were running around trying to go find something out there, what they were really looking for, even if they didn't know it, even if they had it wrapped up in some dualistic conception, the wheel, the sense of I, even if they had it wrapped up in conception. They go through the whole journey, arduously struggling, you know, with full, and as they should, by the way. There's nothing wrong with this. It's, it's This is the circle of life. It's a beautiful thing. And dreams are beautiful. And every time the hero's journey is undertook, it's unique. And, yeah. However, the whole idea, especially with like the soul prison, if that if escaping the soul prison is an analogy for the hero's journey, what the hero is actually looking for, even when they're they think they're looking for this or that, some buried treasure or a prince charming or you know hidden knowledge that'll unlock the secrets of the universe, some shit, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Whatever the case may be, whatever you're seeking. What you realize is the entire time that you were running around trying to find it, what you were trying to find was the one that was running around trying to find it. What you diverged from in the first place to go and, yeah. It, what you were looking for the whole time was the place that you diverged from, like breath. It's all a fractal of breath. <laughs> And so when you exhale, it all, yeah, 
it all diverges and it all spreads apart and it all yeah until it gets done running around and seeking and then it returns to center and when it returns to center it's not like that's the end it's not like you're done it's not like that's the end of existence or that's the end of it's just the beginning of the next breath and see the more and more that you breathe the more times you've repeated a breath or undertaken the hero's journey the more and more you realize one it never started and so it will never end so you don't need to try and find some end point where you're done do you know what i mean you don't need to find a you don't need to seek stillness you don't need to seek stillness if oscillation is your prison you don't need to seek stillness because stopping breath is dying right you don't need to run towards death what you can do instead of running towards death or towards life or away from death or towards pleasure and of yeah and from pain instead of being only the inhale or being only the exhale being only self or being only other or being this and not that or being without or being within you can realize that when you let the breath flow continuously without force meaning without constraint or stops and starts when you just be and let be it's like it all falls into place it's like it all just falls into place and life becomes effortless and there's no more like need to live through fear or anything like that where you have to live for survival pursuing security safety comfort whatever the case may be elephants and mansions and gold and avoiding you know wreckage or death or ruin or withoutness or pain or whatever the fuck i was like positive and negative for as long as you're pursuing positive and avoiding negative you're spinning in a fucking wheel going yeah eating your own tail consuming yourself and keeping yourself trapped in a cycle of suffering also known as the not brahma this knot right here which if you think of each like division that you can imagine of the body kind of like a yin yang this right here is analogous to your kundalini root right behind your womb at the base of your spine it's like an s if the you know the yin yang has a yeah this is analogous to your kundalini root and so the more rigidly you're propelling yourself meaning your awareness your attention your yeah your sense of eye your you your window basically your window for as long as you're propelling it towards the positive and running away towards the negative you're spinning a wheel of suffering you are creating that wheel of suffering that cycle of suffering no one's doing it to you it's the continued following of the grooves of pursuing the pleasant and avoiding the unpleasant or pursuing pain and avoiding pleasure pleasure or any rigid dualistic conceptual thinking yeah if you can get your mind to set down needing to constantly fulfill dualistic whatever yeah the stomach of the mind for as long as you're vying for control from a sense of i pursuing the positive and avoiding the negative you are nodding up your kun yeah you're nodding up your kundalini which is your body's sacred generational creative fire which holds itself steady still in place transcendent of, os of oscillation right so you trying to make it not move and hold on to it by pursuing positive and avoiding negative trying to make it stay the same is actually in fact causing 
the lack of stability, the lack of foundation, and the lack of stillness and unity, and all that. It is what's causing that. It's a machine that is burning down the natural, like, organization of your being. The beast, or the dragon, chasing the dragon. And so, if you, instead of pushing for the positive and avoiding the negative, do you understand? Forcing your breath. <laughs> self-imposed will. Instead of self-imposed willing your breath to go out and go in, you can just let yourself breathe. Let yourself be and let others be. And then the exact same machine which was driving your soul prison becomes the exact vessel machine which will send your kundalini it will awaken it as soon as it's not bound locked to its own yeah it propels it upward and the less and less you cling the higher and higher up it can get until it can loop around your crown chakra which is up here which it can only transcend your crown chakra loop around your your crown when you can see past your ego, past you. And once you can see past yourself, your kundalini can see past yourself, and so it can get around the top. And once it gets around the top, it gets all the way through. You can, yeah, it's just energy in the body, prana. As opposed to if, if stuck energy is a trauma, like a samskar, if stuck energy is a trauma, which you don't want, you know, undesirable or whatever, the soul prison, being stuck. Yeah, Kundalini is the force of the body which frees it and releases it. And yeah, the fire snake which burns through the ice of stuck consciousness, of condensified, congealed consciousness. Which, yeah. That happens by a self imposed will. So, how the hell do I turn this into this? How do I do that? How is that happening? What the hell is happening that's causing that to happen? Do you understand? Like, what the... Everyone can do that. Everyone can do that. How is that happening? How is that happening? Consciousness, my mind, through this ahamkar, this ego, my mind is condensifying consciousness, vibration, energy, matter, the same way that all of creation is manifested in the exact same way. Yeah. All of us did. All life. In the exact same way, consciousness is condensing around this bicep muscle and tensifying it, squeezing it. The same way that your mind does this is the same way that you cling mentally. It is a constant flexing of your mental muscle. That is what leads to things like burnout and shit like that. Because it's your kundalini, your soul's energy constantly consuming itself as opposed to being free-flowing it's constantly consuming itself so instead of you going and eating an apple it's like you eating your arm instead of you like going and getting some food it's like you sitting there and eating yourself consuming yourself and each bite that you eat do you understand? Like, shit, it, it makes your ability to eat go away. The more and more that you cut yourself with your own knife edge, the less and less you'll be able to see or cut through, which is what Kundalini does. It cuts through the stuck energy. So the more and more you sit there and consume yourself, the less and less your Kundalini will be able to cut through the ice. And you consume yourself whenever you're constantly trying to force yourself to be inhale or exhale or gray or any yeah dude yeah can you imagine if you had if you're you had the worldview the mind worldview where i'm only inhale that's all i am is inhale exhale not me that's not yeah i'm not exhale every exhale would be a like like a misalignment with what you experience 
like, it's, you're, every exhale would be painful because it would break your mind's understanding of reality, like ego death. <laughs> every exhale. If you hold a worldview where you think you're only inhale, every exhale that you take, yeah, would be confusing, frustrating, irritating, worrying, because it would be like, shit, what is true? Do you know what I mean? Instead of trying to only be what you've been or what you could be, or only trying to be inhale or only trying to be exhale. If you want to escape soul prison, open the door and take off your prisoner disguise. Nobody is holding you there. It is literally your mind constantly trying to encase you in an idea and others as ideas. It sees other. You know? And so if you're actually looking for that stability, that unity, that peace, serenity, whatever is to be acquired by going out and venturing out on the hero's journey, first of all, venture on the journey. Follow your dreams. Pursue. For as long as you haven't found, it's important that you pursue until you have found. But once you get the message, hang up the phone. So once you realize that you're not bound to the wheel of birth and death or suffering, don't hop back on it. You know what I mean? Don't put yourself back on the wheel. You can live without constantly peddling the cycle you can live without constantly having to force your breath. You can just let yourself breathe. You can just let, you can be and let be. The more and more that you let go of needing to control your life or you. And you only feel this need to control what happens, karma fall, or yourself, as these, as if they're separate, what happens, and yeah, you only feel the need to control that when you see a lack of perfection in that which is, when you're conditional with being, if you will only be under certain circumstances, if you have this, or if this isn't there, do you understand? If you have conditional being, if you're being for condition, you're pedaling the wheel. These thoughts. If, if you're being for condition, you're pedaling the wheel. The more and more unconditional you are with your being, the more and more unconditional any of it becomes. I don't know if that makes sense, but the more and more unconditionally you're, you be, the more and more unconditionally anything that is to be had within or without will be. So, yeah. If you're unconditional with your love and unconditional with being, life will be unconditionally loving and being with you. It goes both ways. If you, whatever you, yeah, dude, just, yeah, yeah. And so if you have stuck up energy on your insides, if you feel plugged up, if you feel disconnected, if you feel far away from yourself, or if you feel without, or if you feel like empty, or if you feel like you're missing something. It boils down to, in my opinion, from what I've experienced, it boils down to conditional love. If you find a lack of perfection in the present, no matter the circumstance, it boils down to, un or to conditional love. And so, if you do not want to be a hypocrite, if you, know, if you do not want to be a hypocrite, as much as you love any of it, 
So this idea of whatever there is to be pursued in the hero's journey example. Yeah. The more and more that you conditionally need that in order to be, the more and more conditional all of it becomes. All of it. Happiness, peace, bliss, serenity, any such. If you are okay with being, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, be it inhale or exhale, without needing to force, without needing to, at any point, begin controlling your breath, the more and more you just be and let be, the more and more you let go, the more and more will be there. If you let go of everything, you just might get everything. And yeah. Once you have, this is what I mean, once you've let go, and once you have found the everything, you have it for as long as you've continued to be, like, let go. For as long as you continue to just let it be, then it will be. At any point, you can begin to feel like, you know, or to see a lack of perfection in the suchness, the thatness, the present moment. As such, free of condition. As soon as you decide that there's something wrong with that, or a fault or something, and you need to impose self-imposed will in order to change or whatever that, yeah, in order to breathe. Once you make the mistake that you need to impose self-imposed will in order to breathe, it's like if you're holding a controller, playing a game, it's, it's like doing this as opposed to actually, yeah, it doesn't actually do anything. Once you start forcing your breath, it, yeah, it doesn't actually give you any more control over what happens. It doesn't. I don't. <laughs> it doesn't. It just makes you feel like it. It just makes you feel like you have some kind of control. But dude, there is a you which has ultimate, absolute control. Ultimate control. Which decides which each atom, each molecule, exactly, yeah. There is a you which has ultimate control. It's just that you can't control that. You can't decide what happens. Can any of us decide what happens as individuals? Can any of us decide if we plant a seed, a karmic seed, cause and effect, self-imposed will? If you plant a karmic seed, can any of us decide whether or not that seed grows? as individuals. Nope. It's up to God, right? Well, the less and less that you try to step in God's place, since I holding, yeah, trying to make a seed grow. Yep, the more and more you vie for personal power or control like that, the less control you will have until you're in soul prison. <laughs> and yet, the more and more you let go of control, the more and more you realize that whatever could happen to you in life is you happening to you. Whatever you could get in life is you getting you. Whatever you could lose in life is you losing you. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason to cling. There's no reason to pursue. There's... As far as the self is concerned. And when you just let yourself breathe, when you just let yourself be, without needing it to be one way or the other, from the self's perspective, do you see? From the perspective of the one who has preferences, yeah, once you can set down those preferences and needing it to be anywhere, yeah, once you let go of everything, everything, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen when you let go of everything. You may lose it forever. Maybe gone. Who knows? 
However, I will say, when you let go, there's a fair chance that, just as with any karma, cause and effect, throw it up, goes down. When you let go of everything, guess what comes back to you? Don't take my word for it. Go find out. But yeah. And once you have everything, once you've let go of everything, and so therefore everything's there, yeah. It, the mind can get like, oh, but then there's nothing to do. There's nothing to... It's more like you don't have to do any of it. You don't have to breathe. It breathes for you. The self will breathe for you. You don't have to consciously make your like body the shape that it is, or your hair the color, or the curl pattern that it is, or your eyes the color that they are. You don't have to sit there and consciously make it so. Even if you get distracted and do something else, all of that still... Yeah! You see what I mean? You don't have to be in control. It's a wonderful weight off your shoulders. And when you realize that you don't have to be the one in control and that you can let go, you realize that, yeah, basically, <laughs> you're in control the whole time, just not from this standpoint, this mode of knowing, of a sense of I, yeah, I, me, myself, yeah. Basically, the you that's in control is the you that's resulting in, like, neurons firing on and off, or resulting in breath oxygenating, or, like, yeah. Like, yeah. It's really hard to describe, but it was just about impossible with the dualistic conceptions graspable by the mind, but yeah. Yeah. As soon as that self, the self that we all are, which is creating, preserving, and destroying, etc., all of it, do you see? The less and less you try and force that self to do anything, and at the same time, simultaneously, it's a fractal in both directions, forcing out here, needing it to be anything. So needing to only experience, or whatever the heck, you know. In either direction. Needing this to be something, or needing that to be something. Or needing them to be, this needing to be one thing, and this needing to be something else. Regardless. The more and more you let go of needing to constantly grasp for control from a sense of I, the freer you will become. It is that constant vying for control through a sense of I, which causes, if the sense of I is like a window or a doorway between the self and creation. Yeah. What keeps that door, the prison door, shut is precisely that pedaling, forcing your breath, the mental exerted conscious effort. Same way you would do this. That is the precise vehicle or like method of action which causes the door to be closed. And that is only a prison for as long as your mind conceives it to be. Because it can also be privacy. It can also be like a little like carriage almost like a little carriage where you can close the door or open it whenever you want to whenever you want to you can... like a room like this bedroom and you see the less and less that you try and force reality to conform to the dualistic concepts graspable by the mind a lot of what appears to be samsara or hell or nirvana or any of that shit becomes part of the perfection. It becomes part of the perfection. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Advaita Vedanta, a drop returning to the ocean. Yeah. If each one of us, the ego, the sense of value, whatever you want to say, whenever you're in soul prison, it's like the entire ocean being contained in a little drop. 
and you can stay in that drought for as long as you want, or you can return to the ocean whenever you want. And when you return to the ocean, you don't lose. You What you were was the entire ocean contained within a drop. That's what, yeah. <laughs> when you return to the ocean, you don't lose that. It can't be lost. It's what you are. What you lose is the form of only being a drop. You only lose your separateness. You only lose this sense of being in prison, your prisoner disguise. And what used to be a crushing prison, a dualistic machine, becomes a dream. It becomes love, as opposed to being heaven or hell, or any one bit of it separately. It becomes something like love, or perfect, or something like that. Again, there's no word that accurately would encapsulate the entire ocean into a drop without distorting it, without prisming it, like white light becoming rainbow in a prism. It refracts. And there's no way for, yeah, for that white light to refract through a droplet without becoming a spectrum. And neither do you see, it's not a mistake for that white light to become a spectrum. It's not a mistake. For as long as the mind thinks that it's a mistake, that any of reality is a mistake or imperfect or it needs to be changed or whatever that, then it, that's the source of suffering. That's the source of, yeah. That's that sense of lack of control is the fact that, yeah. Yeah, so when you just be and let be, when you just be and let be, without needing to force, can any of it, can any of it, any of it. What you get in exchange for giving up that control and that forcefulness and the rigidity and the comfort, you know what I mean? What you get instead is something along the lines of unconditional being, unconditional love, peace, Serenity, bliss. Yeah. And the less and less conditional that peace, serenity, bliss, and all that is, the more untouchable it becomes. Meaning, there's nothing that can take it away. There's nothing that can dirty it. Or... Yeah, it can't be snatched from you anymore. Or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? The less and less you conditionalize your experience of consciousness or your being or any of it, the less and less conditional any of it becomes with you. And the mind doesn't, you know what I mean? The mind can't really wrap itself around that. And yet, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's the beginning of wisdom. When you realize from the standpoint of the mind, the mode of knowing, dualistic, yeah, either understanding or not. When you realize that you know nothing besides words, dude, signs, conceptions, bits. When you realize that's all you know, and nothing of value, just a bunch of dualistic nonsense, a bunch of Inhale is only inhale, and exhale is only an yeah. A bunch of that. The more and more you let go of that crap, the more and more you can freaking breathe, dude. <laughs> the more and more you can be. So yeah. If life feels super conditional to you, if life feels like you can only be happy if you can get this. You can only be happy if you can achieve this. You can only be happy if you can learn this. Whatever. There is nothing about reality which causes it to be like that. It is you deciding that your happiness depends on bits. 
that causes it to depend on bits. Nothing else. Nothing else. And once your happiness and consciousness and being and any of that depends on bits, then it can be, yeah, messed with, blown around, like cut, taken, stolen, concealed, whatever the case may be. And the, the more and more unconditional you're being, you allow your being to become, the less and less freaking touchable it becomes. By any self-imposed will. By any self-imposed will. So any jiva, any ego, which sees within or without and wants to take something from you or whatever it might be, or invade your space, or... Yeah. The less and less. Yeah. You can be completely and totally unconditionally transcendent of the conditions of birth and death. And I recommend it. It's something approximating non-duality. And whatever you're looking for, what you're really looking for is the one who's looking. You don't need to go and get that. Once you realize that that's what you're looking for, you can just let yourself breathe. And you would not believe what life is like when you do that, when you stop doing anything in particular at all. I recommend it. I'm not much Love y'all. <laughs>